Yeah, so thank you for the kind introduction and for letting me talk about my topic again, uh, about learning and games. Yeah, we have already heard today uh, quite yeah, dark patterns in games. Uh, we have heard the difference between gambling and gaming, which I found quite interesting that gambling, there is no learning effect, whereas games have a learning effect. So that's perfect introduction for my talk uh, because I'm going to have a look at, yeah, basically games and financial literacy. Can they help us? to learn something about financial literacy. Can we teach with games? So we had yesterday a very interesting discussion, uh, panel discussion about that. Uh, I will show really some examples and um, yeah, also of course tell you a bit about research, but I have to kind of give it away. Uh, research, yeah, is, is not too much about financial literacy and games. Yeah, when we talk about teaching and learning financial literacy, we first of all have to think about, okay, is that something we need? Yeah, funny question, of course we need. We have heard a lot of uh, talks now that it's necessary that uh, children, also adults, don't spend all the money uh, on dark patterns, but we also know, apart from games, that we have to do a lot of things with money and financial um, issues. So I would say financial literacy has become a real life skill, a skill which also means lifelong learning. Just have a look at what we've, what the new developments are in the last year. So we have already heard a bit about cryptocurrency. Uh, we can now use online uh, banking, things, um, that were not here 20 years ago. Yeah, so um, that's why it's a, a skill, a life skill with lifelong learning. And of course, first of all, we have to have a look at um, what is this financial literacy? Uh, there are some definitions. Um, basically, they are all dealing with the same, but they're a bit different. Uh, I've brought here on, on the slides the definition by OECD, uh, which you have some keywords here, financial awareness, knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behaviors. So you always talk also about financial well-being. What does that mean? So, Let's have a look at the components. So knowledge, I think that's quite easy to find out. You have to know, um, you have to understand money matters. So you have to know your, the vocabulary of money. So you know, uh, what does income mean? What, what is saving? What's a saving account? What's the difference to a current account? So that's basically what you can learn, the hard facts, so to say. Um, you also have of course, to deal with numeracy, because if you can't kind of calculate, yeah, so we have got the value of money or value of things, so it has to do with numeracy, of course. Um, it has to do with attitude and behaviors. Maybe that's not that clear at first sight. What is meant by that? So financial attitude just means knowledge and numeracy is one thing but you have to put that into action. Uh, so that's the attitude and of course also uh, the financial behavior. So do you really dare to do things? Do you really, hmm, if you have to think about, shall I take on a loan to buy the newest phone or whatever or not? Um, and it has to do with confidence. Yeah, so again, uh, a bit, to adhere to do things. And of course, there are other terms used that's a quite similar um, definitions. Just information will be the same like knowledge. So I need the information if I don't have the hard facts. Uh, I need the skills, which means transferring into action. I need the confidence, of course, so um, I know what I can do. So 
it, it allows me, based on my knowledge, based on my skills, uh, that I put that into action without hesitating. And again, the motivation um, to act is really, yeah, how can I, um, what can I do with my money? What can I do with my debts, whatever? So a bit of a difference, but quite similar in the lots of uh, definitions about when are we financially literate? Okay, so that's the one basic. Uh, we know now a bit what we should be. So where do games come in? Um, using games for financial education, I would say they have quite some tradition. Yeah, thinking back of yeah, Monopoly, we also talked about Monopoly yesterday a bit. Uh, so Monopoly is one game that's like to be used by teachers. Uh, if you go back basically to uh, what was kind of the first form of Monopoly, which was the landlord's game, which you basically criticize all these kind of uh, earning money and, and um, which was kind of the negative aspects. Uh, of, of concentrating on earning money, so it, the idea was developed completely different and became our uh, well-known and popular and well often played monopoly, which is also used by teachers. First of all, in the board game version later on, so you can find loads of versions of digital monopoly as well. And there were also other uh, games designed like Lemonade Stand, yeah, so, you know, which was kind of the simulation of typical children um, selling lemonades, which was used in, in uh, the US quite early um, to, to find out what do you need. So I need to calculate what do I have to spend on the ingredients and how much should I sell the, the lemonade for that I make some profit. So these were some, some very early um, yeah, uses of games for, for teaching financial literacy. When we have a look at uh, real learning games, which came so in the 1980s, 1990s, where there was a real boom of, of learning games, financial education was not a focus on it. It was more a focus on learning math, uh, learning vocabulary, things like that. Uh, but of course, at um, the end of the last century, uh, financial literacy became more important uh, because people had to do more and more uh, decisions about financing, um, consumer society, and so on. And that was also the starting point when uh, games dealing with financial literacy, financial education uh, were developed. And of course, nowadays, uh, yes, yeah, so we have this transition to a lot of um, simulation, of course, uh, so where you have all these kind of mechanisms, where you have to an economy or where you have to run a business, things like that. Um, and also for smaller children, so how to save your pocket money and how long you have to save to be able to yeah, buy your favorite toy and things like that. So that was uh, also kind of in the last, I would say, 10, 15 years, there were dozens of these games. Yeah, so why? Why? What's the appeal of, of digital games in education? Of course, in the beginning, like it's always when there are new, uh, when there's new media around, it was kind of thought, okay, we can have a game, let's People, children, play the game, and then they know about it. Yeah, we know it's not that easy. But of course, games have value in education because, first of all, there's the motivational effect. Of course, like James Paul G said, it only goes for the well-designed games. Not all games are motivating and fun to play. Um, so, but basically games are motivating because we feel self-efficient. So if we do something, we can see some results within the game. Um, and of course, games are good putting us in a role, in a situation. Things that are not 
that easy in real life. So managing a big company as a 15-year-old, yeah, might be the exception, I think. Uh, if you have a game, it's quite easy. And of course, games are the safe space. Yeah, so if you fail in a game, there are no real-world consequences. So it's easy. You can just restart, you can learn from your mistakes. That's what gaming is about. So there is, of course, um, all these kind of being active in a digital game is connected to learning theory as well. So if we have a look at the experiential learning, which is uh, something that has become in, in uh, teaching or pedagogy quite important, I would say, or basically in, in our whole life, because what do we do? We learn from our experiences. And if you have a look at this uh, experiential learning cycle uh, by Kolb, he says, okay, we do something. There's an action. And then, of course, we have an experience. We reflect about that. So what was good? What was the outcome? What did we do? We think about it. And all this thinking, yeah, we have a conclusion and think, okay, next time I will try maybe something different, or next time if I succeeded, I will do exactly the same, or next time I will do it completely different. Uh, so we think about it, and which results in an action. And then the cycle starts from the start again. So uh, our action makes another experience. Again, we reflect about it, we think in more detail about it, and result in another action. And that's what basically happens in games. Uh, so if you try out something, you see you get feedback, another very important asset of games. You get feedback, you say, okay, uh, when it comes to, to uh, financial education, okay, you have lost money. Maybe you didn't do a good, your decision wasn't the best one. So let's try it different. Let's try not maybe to buy the most expensive car model, but a cheaper one. What happens? And that's how you learn this experience. And that's what games are really good at. Moreover, what we also can say is that games, of course, are themselves a system and also an economic system. Most games are economic systems, even if they are not um, designed for financial uh, literacy education. Because we have already heard about that quite a lot today. They are virtual goods. We quite often have a currency, whatever currency that is, if it's kind of jewels, if it's flowers, if it's kind of whatever called. But we have a currency. We have virtual goods, which we can buy, which we can sell maybe, so maybe they're also kind of marketplaces. We have also talked about these scarce items in games which have a higher value. So basically things we know from uh, real life. Yeah, so if you want to buy, I don't know, uh, a very exclusive uh, jewelry, yeah, so they're maybe not endless of these necklaces around in the world, which is a scarce item. You have that in games as well, not only jewelry, but quite often weapons or whatever. So that's something we have also as an economic system. Uh, depending on the game, of course, we have also this kind of system of supply and demand, maybe even a marketplace where we can exchange things. We have already heard today uh, that you can also kind of sell your, your skins and, and all these kind of uh, things you get out from the loot boxes. So that's basically something where games try to mirror reality. Um, we can see that quite good uh, in all these tycoon games. Yeah, maybe you have played, I don't know, Roller Coaster Tycoon or uh, you 
try to manage a, a holiday resort, whatever. So all these tycoon games, which have been around for quite some time, are nothing else than trying to put you in the shoes of somebody uh, being responsible. And of course, it's about earning money, but you also have to uh, do a lot of decisions. Of course, tycoon games are not really made for financial education, so they are not learning games, they are made for fun. Um, but uh, when we have a look at designing video games for financial education, and um, I've had a look at the literature, uh, Maynard and um, my colleagues defined some things that are important when you want to design video games really for financial education. So you can see here, some things are of course similar with other games, but uh, is that if you have financial education, it's important not kind of that the things stay in the game. So maybe I'm really good at playing tycoon games or any other kind of game, but in real life, um, yeah, I always spend too much money and uh, I, I never, so you know this saying, uh, at the end of the money, there's too much month left. Yeah, so um, there's always this kind of, yeah, difference between I'm good at the game and how do I react in reality? Just remind you back on uh, the definition, financially literate means you can really use your knowledge and your skills also for your actions. So what do we have to do? What should games uh, be thought of? Of course, they should be engaging. If a learning game is not engaging, yeah, of course, you could force learners to play the game. Then we are, again, with the definition, which we heard before, is it a game if I'm not willing to play the game? Um, so basically, designing a learning game for financial education, you have to think about how can I motivate my learners? How can they engage? What kind of gameplay? It's a difference if I have, I don't know, seven or eight year old children or if I want to do a game for adults. Um, second uh, one is to cultivate the self-efficiency in financial literature. So, um, of course, it has to do with the knowledge. Yeah, so does the game increase knowledge and skills? Uh, does it promote a positive change? Um, and also, but also, do they have fun when uh, playing the game? Because that's also important. Uh, because if they don't have fun, they will leave the game. Um, you enable game players to take positive actions. What does that mean? So, what type of actions are integrated in the game? Uh, so, what can you do as a player? That's very important. So, if you have just a limited decision or not meaningful decisions to take in a game, um, yeah, it will not really work out. Um, next one is to support sustained behavior change because financial literacy does not mean if I play the game, okay, for two weeks I will try to save my money and then I fall back in my old patterns just by uh, spending more than I have. So it also has to think, how can we support sustained behavior? Something very, very um, difficult. Uh, so, but when designing, you should think about it. And of course, uh, it's also about realizing positive outcomes. So can there be any impact by the game? Uh, do players increase maybe um, their savings after having played the game, uh, reduce debts, or maybe think of retirement plans. Uh, so that's something which is not easy for especially younger people to think of what will happen when I'm 40, 50 years older. Uh, so things like that. So um, when you hear that, you can imagine it's really hard to have a game that can really do all these things. What games are good at, and I will show you just briefly some uh, examples how 
uh, these typical learning games are made of is good at, of course, knowledge, because that's easy. You can check up the knowledge, uh, maybe even the skills. But when it comes to transferring the skills into reality, it's really hard and quite often what we will see um, even the game designers know the games can't do that. So we need uh, trainers, we need teachers, uh, we need even family. We need someone to help uh, this transfer, um, to make this transfer. So Money Master, for example, um, also it's, it's a narrative digital role-playing game. It's about, of course, decision-taking in uh, finance. It's more... Um, it's targeted at the 13 to 17 year old, so adolescents, teenagers. There's also a, a version for younger ones. Uh, it's about also something that's important for this kind of games or learning games in general. Uh, it really is connected to the life of the age group. So nothing about, um, I think yesterday uh, I said something like, not connected to stock exchange or what you do at the stock exchange or trading at the stock exchange because for a 13 year old that's not really relevant huh? um, and as you can see here money master targeting of course schools teachers they also have teacher material because the game is more about information about trying out things in a safe space but not uh, doing all the way um, we have talked quite a lot today about FIFA. Um, if you're in kind of sports games, there's also something like the financial football game, um, uh, which was yeah, um, paid by Visa. So you see, uh, it's also kind of a connection that all these kind of credit cards or banks quite often want children or teenagers to help get our uh, young ones uh, financially literate. So uh, topics, typical things, budgeting, saving, um, debts, and also a teacher guide. Uh, a bit different, uh, zombie apocalypse here. Uh, the debts are kind of hunting you in the form of zombies. Uh, so think of engaging um, the players. It's a different, completely different approach. Uh, but of course, it's also about well-being, it's more about your credit scores, um, things like that. Um, two more examples, just quickly. Uh, Shiro Heroes, which is um, a game in, in German. It's about bank accounts and online transactions and, of course, how to avoid debts. This is unfortunately a very big topic in, in financial literacy. And something that also research has found out these games work best when they are accompanied by that um, basically children or teenagers have their first account. So they make their real life experience and the game experience and make kind of combine that. And um, yeah, of course, an Austrian example, uh, the Financial Life uh, Challenge, which is uh, connected to um, the Financial Life Park, so an exhibition or a kind of a workshop where you can go to and the game is uh, combined with this workshop. So you can see um, it's, again, not only the game, but you have uh, to do yeah, things together with the game. The game can't help you to tackle all your financial problems, unfortunately. Yeah, um, I think I took already that away, and this is my last slide. Um, do games improve uh, financial literacy? At the moment, we have a lot of games for financial literacy, uh, most of them targeting children or um, teenagers or young adults, but we do not have enough research how they really work or when they work. I told you a bit, we know a bit about it, that they work best when you combine it with real life experience. But of course, it depends on many factors, how or if games can improve financial literacy. It has to do, of course, with uh, your 
uh, pre-knowledge you already have. It has to do with where you grew up, so the family background and so on. So it's really hard to find out how games work best, but of course they can support uh, financial literacy, education, and I think they are really good tools to support teachers. Yeah, and that's, uh, thank you, and yeah, maybe you want to try out some of the financial uh, literacy games. <laughs>